Hello YouTube. Do you remember way back in the heady days of, I think it was spring, I said I'd try and do these monthly, be prolific and, you know, efficient. <sighs> yeah, I had a few problems. My MacBook has died. I had two motherboards set themselves on fire. Ever heard of standoff screws? Turns out they're really important to a computer. Yeah, I'd never heard of them either. I have some now. Anyway, today I'm here to finally talk about Metro 2034 by Dmitry Glukovsky. Now, um, interestingly enough, um, I was talking about this because of somebody on, I think it was Vote? Was that the Vote or Reddit? I think it was Vote. Talking about um, the Stalker series, which is based on a novel called Roadside Picnic. And somebody was saying that Grukovsky was somewhat derivative and a hack writer because he mentioned stalkers in his novel. And um, I disagree. I haven't read Roadside Picnic, however, though I have seen the film, which is a very good film, and I played most of the first game. I've also played both of the Metro games, uh, which is where I first heard about it. I've read both novels as well, and the novels are very different from the game. This one in particular has almost nothing whatsoever to do with either of them. Uh, the main character from the games, and from the first novel, Ation, features only lightly in this one, and he's mostly left as a glorified telephone operator. His entire purpose in it mostly is to try and get through to um, one of the main stations. I can't for the life of, remem life of me remember which one it was now, because I read this quite a while ago. I was intending to review it a lot sooner. But the story mostly follows a chap called Hunter, Colonel Hunter. And however, it's mostly told from the point of view of an elderly gentleman called Homer, or nicknamed Homer after Homer's Iliad. He chronicles, he has lots of stories, and he kind of sees it as his purpose to tell people stories. He's one of the few who remembers what life was like before everybody went into the metro. There's also a young woman in her late teens called Sasha, who he sees as being the heroine of the story and the potential love interest for, 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 Homer, for Hunter. There is a little bit of that shown, but it doesn't really pan out the way you'd expect it to. And a lot more of the story actually revolves around Homer forming a somewhat paternal bond with Sasha, who has lost her father. When we, first, when we are first introduced to her, we pretty much see her going through the death of her father, who'd be making excursions to the surface and lying to her about how much of um, an impact the radiation was having on her and telling her that he was able to clean the, the filters on his um, gas mask, which he obviously wasn't because he died. By the way, this is apple, this is apple, toffee apple flavoured Robinson's juice. It is not urine. I know it looks that way. Anyway. You remember I also said when I was reviewing um, the Nightwatch series that I had had experience with the, the translator, Andrew Bromfield, and I commented on how the writing style seemed to have been very much taken from the original writer of that, Sergei Lukyanenko. Well, the, this is also translated by him, and the, the style is completely different. Now, it could just be that Bromfield himself is an extremely talented translator, and I'm sure he is, but I also think that the vast majority of the stylistic elements of both novels come from the original writers. For example, this, although the chapters are fairly average length for chapters, within each chapter you'll generally only have two or three pages of a specific event and then it'll jump to something else, and it feels, it makes it flow a lot more briskly than a novel usually would which, even though it's fairly short, I think it clocks in at about 100,000 words, um, which it used to be average length for a paperback novel, but these days you're looking at more than 150 to 180,000. <clears> it does make it flow a lot more briskly, and it allows a lot more to happen. It, it can be, at times, give the impression of feeling like there's too much going on, it's jumping around too much, but it works. It gives you all the, the information you need for a scene without allowing any of them to drag on too long. And it's especially noteworthy in a scene where they come to our, our most infamous station, where people just vanish. This white mist, this milky white mist comes down around them and everything just goes to shit. The scene there is extremely tense. 
extremely frenetic in the way it's presented and it lasts again for only about three pages but so much happens in there it really gives you a sense of the bleakness a very um, uniquely Russian sensibility which is interesting to read considering that again Brumfield translated both whereas um, there's a lot of the gothic sort of cynical side of Russian mentality in the Night Watch series uh, it's still primarily optimistic this the metro books have none of that they are all about the end of the world it's not about not even about survival anymore it's about these people just holding on as long as they possibly can knowing they are fighting a losing battle but just too stubborn to give up it's hunter uh, um, um, symbolizes that he typifies that mentality more than anybody else in the entire series. Um, he knows he's going to die someday, but he's one of those who's like, well, I'm going down, I'm taking some of you bastards with me. And he most certainly does. It then has an, a rather interesting climax. Because it's so depressing in so many ways, yet yeah? there's just that faint, ever so slight, desperate sense of hope that something else might one day better come out of all this and that they're just clinging on valiantly trying to reach it but knowing they're never going to so um, I suppose when you look at it like that what it's really all about is human stubbornness the inability to give in to keep fighting even when everything is lost because we can't just lay down roll over and play dead because where would we be then? And as such, I thoroughly recommend this. I recommend reading both of them. Um, but the great thing about it is that you don't really need to read both to appreciate them. They do stand on their own. Um, there's, there are some references from this to the previous. But not a great deal. There's also a Metro 2035 on its way, which I'm told um, is mostly written at this point and will focus a lot more around the events of the second game, Metro Last Light, which I also enjoyed immensely but for different reasons. something I actually originally read as a teenager. Um, these are actually novels for young adults, they're aimed more at uh, children, like 12 to 15 sort of age. Uh, at the time I didn't realise it's actually part of a trilogy. And it was Reddit, of all places. I could not remember the name of me, I kept thinking it was something to do with Oz. The Half Men of Oz, or the Something of Oz. Uh, you can understand the difficulty it was having with that, but I went to Reddit and I mentioned a scene on a bridge that takes place in the first novel that always stuck with me and somebody was able to point it out to me which was great so I now have them picked up all three of them it was a slightly different version than the other and have yet to finish reading them but they're quite short so I can't see that taking too long these hopefully will be up in about three weeks so until then all that remains for me to say is thank you for watching and being so patient <laughs>